Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matthew Ted, Chief Executive of the RSA. Delighted to welcome you here today for this special lunchtime event. Um, before we begin, could I ask you to turn your mobile phone to silent? We're filming and live streaming uh, today, as always, so a big welcome to uh, people joining us online. There's already a bit of an online conversation going on. The hashtag for the event is RSA Democracy, so please do join in on Twitter. Now, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome today's speaker, Yasha Munk. Um, occasionally, you read a book uh, which uh, not only do you find fascinating uh, and find yourself wanting to write about, but it's a book you really do want other people to read. So um, this was the effect of reading The People Versus uh, Democracy uh, on me. I think it's one of the most important books I've read in the last few years. Yesha is one of the world's leading experts on the crisis of liberal democracy and the rise of populism. He's a lecturer on government at Harvard University, executive director of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change and host of the Good Fight podcast. His incisive political analysis is the one in high profile fans such as me, no, no, such as Francis Fukuyama, Michael Sandel, and Anne Marie Slaughter. His new book has just been published to wide acclaim. It's causing uh, uh, debates all over the world. It's one of the few books on populism to also offer practical steps to reverse the trend, and we'll talk about some of those later. So, uh, Yasha will speak. Uh, he and I will have a conversation, and then we'll open it up because there's some really important ideas for us all to discuss. So, without further ado, please give him a warm welcome in. Give, uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Yasha Munk. Thank you. Uh, well, well, thank you very much for having me uh, speak in this distinguished uh, venue. Um, I was thinking, uh, you said that, that Karl Marx spoke here at some point in the 19th century. Um, my, my grandparents uh, grew up in shuttles in Central Europe and made the mistake in the teenage years of turning into Marxists and communists and stayed in Poland after World War II to um, participate in building up a wonderful society. Uh, that went sour relatively quickly, and I think it may be one of the reasons why I started to wonder whether our political system was quite as stable as people thought, because I've had this experience in my family of people uh, recognizing that a political regime that, that, that they're a part of actually turns out to be a lot less stable than they anticipated. Um, but when I was growing up, um, they would always tell these, tell these jokes about socialist Poland and the Soviet Union. Um, and, and I didn't normally quite understand them, because they referenced these politicians that I didn't know, and they had a sort of sense of political hopelessness to which I couldn't quite relate. But I've been thinking uh, back to one of those jokes over the last couple of years as I've been following what's going on in the United States and here in this country as well. Um, it's very straightforward, so let me just quickly tell that story. Um, a man walks home late at night from work. Uh, he's, he's nearly back at his apartment when he sees another guy uh, a few steps away, completely drunk, throwing up into the gutter. And as soon as he sees him, he puts a big smile on his face. He walks over, uh, puts a hand on his shoulder, and says, I completely agree with your political analysis, comrade. <laughs> so that's a little bit how I felt over the last years. Um, and I think we need to make sense of just uh, what it is that might make us sympathize with that poor drunken man. What's been going on in our politics? Well, I, my starting point is that some of the most fundamental assumptions we've had about our political system, about liberal democracy, have turned out in the last decades to be mistaken. The most extreme and often caricatured form of that assumption was expressed by Francis Fukuyama in his idea of the end of history. But even though a lot of people, in some ways unjustly, sneered at his work, the underlying thought was one that was actually a matter of wide consensus among citizens, journalists, political scientists around the world. We all recognized that there was uh, some poor countries that were trying to be democracies, that were struggling to establish that political system. We all knew that it wasn't obvious that every autocratic system in the world would transition to democracy. But we all also assumed that there was a certain set of affluent countries with deep, long democratic histories in which we could take the future somewhat for granted. In the terms of one famous political science paper from the 1990s, once you'd had a couple of changeovers through governments, through free and fair elections, once GDP per capita had reached about $14,000 in today's terms, democracy was safe. There wasn't a single example in history of a democracy in a country like that collapsing. 
And the way that this manifested supposedly was through a process of democratic consolidation, which was thought of as a one-way street, and through which democracy became, quote-unquote, the only game in town. We would get to a stage, and in countries like the United Kingdom, like the United States, like Germany, where I grew up, like Sweden and Italy, we had gotten to the stage, supposedly, where nearly everybody agreed on the importance of democracy. A huge majority of citizens rejected authoritarian alternatives to democracy out of hand. And there weren't any powerful political parties and forces that actually challenged the basic rules and norms of that political system. Well, as I've showed in some of my work, before Donald Trump was elected and before this country voted to exit the European Union, um, some of those things were starting to change. In the United States, over two-thirds of older Americans born in the 1930s and 1940s said that it was absolutely essential to them to live in a democracy. Among younger Americans born since 1980, less than one-third did. People became much more open to authoritarian alternatives to democracy. 20 years ago, one in 16 Americans said that army rule was a good system of government. Now it's one in six. Among young and affluent Americans, it's actually gone up from six to 35% over the course of 20 years. And this is not just a story about Americans being a little strange on the other side of the pond. Uh, it's a similar story in various European countries as well. In Germany, 16% said that a strong ruler who doesn't have to bother with parliament elections was a good system of government 20 years ago. Now it's 33%. In France and the United Kingdom, it's doubled from 25 to 50% of people who say a strong ruler who doesn't have to bother with parliament and elections is a good idea. Now, it's a little difficult to interpret all of those data points. It's not clear whether people who say this sort of thing in polls actually mean it. Um, but we also see a real transformation in the voting behavior of ordinary citizens. We see that the average vote share of populist parties in Europe was 8% in 2000 and is over 25% now. Winston Churchill famously spoke of an iron curtain descending from Trieste in the north of Europe as to, um, so from Staten in the North Europe to Trieste in the South. Well, now you can start in Staten in the Baltic Sea and drive far further south than Trieste to Athens in the Aegean and never leave the populist belt, never leave a country ruled by a populist in Central Europe. And so I think to make sense of what is going on, we have to understand that there's two basic elements to our political systems. We live in liberal democracies, which means that we live in political systems that promise both to give people some modicum of individual liberty, where we get to determine ourselves how to lead our lives, what to say, not to say, whether to worship and to whom, what kind of relationship to start, and so on. And the second value, collective self-rule that there isn't somebody who's born to rule over us, there isn't a dictator who cannot be displaced. We collectively determine what happens in our politics. And the first big argument I make in this book is that these two elements of our political system are starting to fall apart, that it's getting more and more difficult to fulfill both of those things at the same time. For a long time I show, not just in Britain, not just in various European countries, also in the United States, also in Canada and other places, we have seen the rise of what I would call a form of undemocratic liberalism or rights without democracy, in which we do a reasonably good job at uh, protecting the, the rule of law and the separation of powers and respecting individual rights. But our political system is not responsive enough to what people actually want. We're not actually translating popular views into public policies. And part of that reason is the influence of money on our politics, is the degree to which legislators in many countries have become a milieu or part that doesn't have much contact with ordinary constituents. But another part of the reason is a little bit more complicated to wrap our heads around because we are bound up with some of those institutions. And that is the way in which more and more decisions have been taken out of democratic contestation. In Europe, it sometimes takes the form of a European Union, the European Commission, but you can see in the case of the United States that it's 
true in countries that aren't part of the European Union as well. You have the rise of Supreme Courts that have greater and greater power of judicial review. You have the rise of central banks that aren't just more independent than they used to be, but also make more important and consequential political decisions. You have the rise of independent agencies, like the Environmental Protection Agency or the Consumer Protection Bureau or the whole set of quangos that we have in this country. You have the rise of trade treaties and international organizations. And once you take all of those things together, a lot of the most important decisions are taken by experts and technocrats who often do a good job. And the solution that the populists sometimes recommend of just getting rid of these institutions isn't always realistic. But even if we recognize some of the good things these institutions do, we also need to remember the degree to which people have a point when they say, nobody really listens to us. What we say doesn't particularly matter. Now on the other side, you get the rise of what I would call a liberal democracy or democracy without rights. I think it's important to, to use those terms and to remember what is actually the problem with some of the authoritarian populist challenges to our political system. When you remember the uh, Swiss referendum on the building of minarets eight years ago, people often decry that as undemocratic. So what happened in Switzerland is that a majority of the population voted to ban the building of minarets, as a result of which the Swiss constitution now reads, and I quote, there's freedom of religion in Switzerland, the building of minarets is forbidden. Doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, and those decried in the Swiss papers and some British papers and the American papers as undemocratic. But that to me is a conceptual confusion. When a majority of the people voted for this referendum, that doesn't seem to be undemocratic. What it is, is illiberal. It undermines the, 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 the rights of the largest religious minority in Switzerland, in a way that I personally find intolerable, but that we need to describe precisely. Now, the agent that brings about the rise of these illiberal democracies are often called populists. And it can be a little bit confusing what they have in common. When you think of the President of the United States, who's often called a populist, Donald Trump, he doesn't appear to be particularly fond of Muslims. When you look at the President of Turkey, who's also often described as a populist, he doesn't appear to be overly fond of anybody who's not a Muslim. When you think of some populists like Donald Trump, they're quite right-wing on the economy, slashing the welfare state and uh, tax rates. When you think of others like Hugo Chavez and the man who is just re-elected in quotation marks in a sham election as his successor, Nicolas Maduro, uh, they're very left-wing economically and have business at their enemies. So is it coherent to talk about populists as one category at all? Should we just dispense with the term? I think not. I think we need the term. Because what populists have in common is a particular kind of way of talking about politics and a particular imagination of how politics works. What all of these people do is to say that politics is at its heart incredibly simple and straightforward. That the reason why we have various political problems today is that the political elite is corrupt and self-serving that all that's needed in order to solve these challenges is for somebody who truly speaks for the people. I am the populist. I am your voice, Trump said at the Republican National Convention, to take power, and they're going to solve everything in a heartbeat. Well, there's two problems that follow from that. The first is that they often make false promises. I think you have some examples of this uh, here in Britain. Uh, you also do in the United States. Who knew that things could be so complicated, Trump says. Who knew that healthcare could be so complicated? If a meeting actually happens, I think we might soon hear uh, on the TV news, who knew that negotiating with Kim Jong-un might turn out to be complicated? Um, but of course, they don't actually want to admit that they gave you a, a bunch of false promises and so on. And so what they do instead is to start to cast blame, to say that they and they alone truly represent the people, truly stand for the legitimate political people, and anybody who disagrees with them is therefore illegitimate. If a newspaper criticizes them, then that's fake news, and they need to register as lobbyists or agents. 
if the opposition disagrees with your preferred course of action, then the traitors. If judges insist on certain niceties of constitutional law, then they're enemies of the people. And this is surprisingly consistent across all of these cases. And we now see in Hungary how far that can go and how quickly. Viktor Orban was democratically elected, but as soon as he took office, he started to undermine the independence of state news and television stations. He put tremendous regulatory and economic pressure on critical private media outlets. He uh, stacked the judiciary with his loyal followers, reappointed the electoral commission, gerrymandered the voting system, and as a result, uh, the elections a couple of months ago in Hungary, which may seem like a relatively minor event in which an election in a small European country was re-elected for a third time, had what uh, Karl Marx standing in this lectern would have called world historical importance. Which is to say that it is the one clear case that disproves that theory from the 1990s that I was talking about. Hungary has had many more than two changes of government for free and fair elections. It has a GDP per capita that is significantly above $14,000 in today's terms. And yet it is no longer a true democracy. And that, by the way, is in many ways a deeper challenge to the stability and the legitimacy of the European Union than Brexit. Because how you can justify to European citizens living in democratic countries to share part of their sovereignty with a country that's effectively ruled by a dictator is uh, an underappreciated problem. Now, I want to say something quite brief about how to think about the causes of this development. And then perhaps in conversation we can talk a little bit more about some of the solutions that I start to outline in the book. Um, let me take a minute to tell you a story about a chicken. Now, it's the kind of chicken that, uh, that all of you would like. You know, it's very fashionable now in London and other major cities. It's organic and free range and all of those kinds of things. It gets to run around its farm. Um, it's a very happy life, but the other chickens, the other animals on the farm warn it and say, be careful, the farmer only seems nice. One day he's going to come and kill you. Uh, and the chicken says, what are you talking about? He's a really nice guy. He you know, feeds me every day. He mutters some encouraging words. Why would things suddenly be so different? Well, Bertrand Russell, who presumably also at some point uh, came to speak at the RSA um, and whom I'm stealing the story from, um, knew better than the chicken, writing in his wry wit that um, uh, one day the farmer did come to wring the chicken's neck, demonstrating that more sophisticated views as to the uniformity of causation would have been to the chicken's benefit. <laughs> so it seems to me that if we want to understand what has happened to democracy, we have to ask the chicken question, by which I mean that there's scope conditions in how uh, the world works. That as long as the chicken was too thin for the market, the farmer had a reason to keep feeding it. Once it was fat enough to fetch a good price, he had a reason to slaughter it. And in a similar way, we have to look at what it is that made liberal democracy so remarkably stable in the post-war period, but that may no longer be true. How have the scope conditions changed? And to do that, we can't just tell these weird local political stories. Wherever I go, I hear local political stories. In America, populism is there because the Republican Party has started to radicalize with Newt Gingrich in the 90s and so on. Uh, in Germany, the populists are rising because Angela Merkel is far too moderate and she's left too big a space to the right of a party. It seems implausible that both of these things are true at the same time. We need to look at factors that are true across these contexts and so far as possible. And it seems to me that there's three obvious ones to think about here. The first is the stagnation of living standards for many ordinary citizens. In the United States from 1945 to 1960, the living standard of an average citizen doubled. From 1960 to 1985, it doubled again. Since 1985, it's essentially been flat. It's essentially been stagnant. There's very similar stories to be told in the United Kingdom and in continental Europe, with especially young people not getting their fair share of economic growth and having to spend a vast 
share of the money that you make on things like housing. And that really changes how people think about politics. They used to say, well, I don't know that I you know, trust Westminster, that I trust Washington, D.C. I don't know that I particularly like the prime minister, but you know, in the end, I'm doing twice as well as my parents did. My kids are going to do twice as well as me, so let's give them the benefit of a doubt. They seem to be sticking to the end of the deal. Well, younger people uh, now, I think, are saying, I've worked really hard all my life. I, I don't have much to show for it. Um, you know, my kids are probably going to do worse than me, so let's throw some shit against the wall. How bad could things get? We've got to change something. And though it's not necessarily the case that the poorest people vote for populists the most, there's a very clear geographic pattern to populist support, which is remarkably consistent across countries. So it is always the parts of a country that are less affluent, that have had less recent economic investment, fewer high-skilled people, uh, even a sh higher share of jobs that might be automated away in the coming decades that vote for the populists. Now, there's been a big debate in the last years about whether the roots of populism are economic or cultural. Is it about uh, stagnation of living standards and inequality, or is it about you know, immigration and culture? And I think that's a, a wrong way of thinking about that. These two things usually go together. The word isn't monocausal. If you are doing pretty well economically, you're happy with your life, and you see an immigrant move in next door, and they're doing great, perhaps they're doing a little better than you, you can be happy for them. If you feel like you haven't gotten a fair end of the deal and your society isn't treating you quite right and then you see somebody new coming in next door and they're doing better than you or they're your boss, you're much more tempted to say, well, what's that all about? Why are they doing better than I am? This, this isn't right. Now, on the cultural front, I think we have to understand that we live in a set of countries that were founded with a pretty strongly mono-ethnic and monocultural conception of themselves. If you go back to 1960 and you ask a, a, a German or an Italian or a Swede, or for that matter, most Englishmen, you know, what truly makes somebody a member of your country, of your nation, they would say, well, somebody who descends from the same ethnic stock. And Britain might say, well, somebody who descends from my ethnic stock, or for that matter, you know, from Scottish or Welsh ethnic stock, that it's still a similar ethnic idea of who belongs in the country. Thankfully, over time, it has started to change. As you've had mass immigration, uh, a lot of people have embraced the idea that somebody can be British irrespective of uh, white or brown or black, of whether they're Christian or Muslim or Hindu or Jewish. But part of the population is strongly resisting that idea, and in a way that shouldn't be a surprise to us because it is a historically unique experiment. We don't know of any democracies that started with that mono-ethnic conception of themselves and have transformed into truly multi-ethnic societies. There's no alternative to it, but it's a complicated project for which there's no historical precedent. Now, in North America, the situation is both similar and different. It's different in the sense that uh, those have always been deeply multi-ethnic societies, but it's similar in that uh, they've always had a strict racial and religious hierarchy. And we've come a very long way in the last 50 years in overcoming that hierarchy. Undoubtedly, it's better to be a member of just about any minority in the United States today than 50 or 20 years ago. Perhaps not even two years ago, but certainly compared to 50 or 20 years ago. Um, but again, there's a lot of people who have something to lose from that. There's people who have privileges to lose, who has unfair advantages to lose, to lose even a sort of social status that just came naturally with being white, with being Protestant, to lose. And so it shouldn't surprise us that some of those people are rebelling against those changes. Now, if people are pretty unhappy because they feel like the system isn't delivering for them in the way it did, if there's a backlash against the slow transformation to an equal multi-ethnic society, the third important point is the rise of the internet and of social media, which allows people to act on these frustrations to exploit them in a much more radical way. Uh, we're in central London, close to just about any broadcasting, uh, uh, you know, close to the BBC, close to the kind of biggest newspapers, publishing houses, were all within a couple of miles from here. And 25 or 30 years ago, the people who owned those institutions, who worked with those institutions, who governed those institutions, had a tremendous influence on what could and couldn't be said in our society. 
And sometimes it meant that they excluded important voices, but sometimes it also meant that they were able to exclude noxious voices. Now, that slowly changed. If we had a form of one-to-many communication 25 years ago, the rise of the internet democratized one-to-many communication. Suddenly, anybody could have a website, and the whole world could come and read the content you presented on it free of charge. But it was still difficult to attract people. Why would they go to joesmith.com rather than the times.co.uk? Social media took this one step further, giving rise to a form of many-to-many -many communication. Suddenly, if you are um, you know, making a particularly cute video of your cat or dog, or if you, you know, film a particularly striking incident of police violence, even if you only have 50 followers on Facebook and Twitter, that video can be seen by millions of people within a matter of an hour or two. And what this does is not empower democratic activists in the way that techno-optimists hoped a few years ago, nor does it necessarily destroy democracy in the way that some techno-pessimists now want today. It empowers agents of change and outsiders in society relative to gatekeepers and insiders. And this means that uh, some wonderful brave activists, like somebody who I uh, was, was at an event with in, in New York on Monday, one of the survivors of a horrible shooting in uh, the high school in, in Florida, uh, can gain a tremendous following and tremendous influence in a matter of months. And that is wonderful and admirable. But it also means that people who want to spread hate, people who want to uh, spread false information, people who want to rouse up our worst instincts have a much easier way organizing politically and finding a big hearing. And in conjunction with some of the underlying frustrations that we've had all along, that becomes a, a very dangerous cocktail. So I have a bunch of thoughts about solutions, but uh, I'll shut up now to give you a chance to grow me. <laughs> Thanks, Yasha. I'll, I'll do precisely that and focus on um, the kind of the solution side of this. Um, so if you think of those um, drivers, uh, certainly the economic driver looks pretty grim for us, uh, in the sense that most economists think we're near the end of the economic cycle. We've got Brexit, which even if it turns out to be accepting the same rules and not making rules, won't be great. And then we've got three decades of fighting against the headwind of people like me getting old, stopping paying taxes, living off welfare, and becoming dependent on the health service. So it's unlikely that we're going to get economic growth lifting us out of this situation. So what would you say... Ah, thank you. <laughs> what would you say we need to be doing, given that it's extremely unlikely that there's going to be a kind of return to, you know, 3% a year growth rates and rising living standards. That only leaves us with social mm. media and culture as our routes <laughs> out of what, you know, your kind of road to damnation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, by the way, even if you had 3% of growth a year, it's not clear to me that it would buy you the same stability than it once did. I mean, when you think about the fundamental transformation in people's uh, lives that happened from, say, 1940 to 1970 or 1980, it's just astounding. I mean, back in 1940, we didn't have antibiotics. Most people didn't have access to a doctor. Uh, very few people had any form of, of central heating. Um, you know, virtually nobody had a car. They lived in very cramped spaces. And 30, 40 years ago, there was a vast middle class that, you know, obviously had access to a doctor and to antibiotics and all of those things. Uh, but that had their own home, uh, and that had a car, or perhaps two, that had a television and a home entertainment system, and that lived 25, 30 years longer than their parents and grandparents had. Now, even if you had 3% economic <coughs> growth a year now, it wouldn't change people's quality of life in as fundamental a way as, as that rise of the mass middle class made possible. Um, and as you're saying, there's good reasons to think that we're not going to have 3% of economic growth in any case, that, that is going to be much more limited than that. Um, now, you know, one possible uh, implication of that is that uh, 
this may just be a fundamental driver undermining the stability of democracy and there may not be uh, that much we can do about that. And my book is sort of ambivalent on that. I mean, I think it, it, it is possible that we're fighting against windmills and that the forces of history are pushing against democracy. But I wouldn't be quite as defeated as that because I do think that there's lots of things we can do to make our society more fair and to ensure that people do have a sense that they experience some amount of economic progress in their lives. When you think of uh, the big challenges now, I think politicians could take much more radical uh, steps to solve them. Um, think of something like the problem of taxation. Um, I think, you know, economists like like Piketty, who, who have given brilliant analyses of what's going on, I think are sometimes too tempted to just say the solution has to be at the global level because that's a way of deferring action. I think there's a lot the nation state can do in the economic sphere. And one of those is to ensure that people properly pay tax. Um, in the United States, if you are a US citizen or a resident, you have to pay tax in the US even if you spend 200 days a year on the beach. I think the United Kingdom should do that. That's an easy thing to do, solve some of your non-DOM problems. I think we should put vastly more resources into finding out when people are hiding their money in tax havens and prosecuting them. If multimillionaires and billionaires actually had a real risk of going to prison if they hide a little bit of their money, they would be much less likely to do it, much less likely to do it. On the corporate taxation side, I think we have to find ways of using the best uh, resource of the nation state has always had the defining resource of a nation state, and that's territory. To say it doesn't matter whether your nominal headquarters is in Dublin or in London, if you want to sell your iPhones here and your Google ads here, wonderful, please come here, but we've got to pay a minimum amount of tax in this country. Um, so that's one set of things. The other set of things is that uh, there's also some stuff about productivity, which is complicated, but there's also some stuff about expenses. When you look today, uh, people's Pre-tax income has not done very well, but it's sort of gone okay. People's post-tax income has actually done quite well because we have actually become more redistributive in most societies, including the United Kingdom over the last decades. But people's disposable income has stagnated or collapsed. And why is that? In the United States, because of the cost of uh, health and education, as well as housing. And in the United Kingdom and other European countries, overwhelmingly because of housing. And this is because of choices but we make, because we make it really hard for people to build new housing units, because uh, we overregulate in this sphere, because people want to you know, keep the gains that they've made in the past and oppose anything that might potentially negatively affect the housing values, even if it means that the children and grandchildren don't have anywhere to live. Um, but this is self-inflicted wounds. So I don't know how much all of that adds up to, but there's certainly a set of things that we haven't done yet, and before we sort of fall into uh, pessimism and, and, and saying, oh, there's nothing we can do. I think we should go and do them. So I'm interested uh, in um, who the target is of this book. Because in the history of extremism, uh, often the group that one feels the most anger towards is not so much the extremists, because their agenda was always clear. It was the people who were part of the establishment who failed to recognize the urgency of the task that needed doing. And so I'm thinking, for example, of you know, newspapers which attack the democratic system you know, day after day after day and, and, and are kind of seem to be entirely motivated by whipping up the self-righteousness of the population. I'm thinking about lobbyists who might abstractly accept the idea for greater social justice and inclusion but actually argue for the lowest possible taxes mm -hmm. for their company and the best possible regulatory framework regardless of the wider interest. Is, is, you know, it, is what you're trying to speak to here is the lack of urgency from those people who would never think of, never dream of themselves as being populists or authoritarian, much less authoritarians. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very important thing. And you see it in things like the, the, the reaction of the European Union to Hungary, right? I mean, this is a, a fundamental transformation in, in what's going on in the world and the nature of the European Union. And yet, uh, you know, from Claude Juncker to Angela Merkel, all of the major European politicians congratulated Viktor Orban on a supposed re-election. Um, and his party, Fidesz, remains a member of the largest faction in the European Parliament, the European People's Party, that counts as members the Christian Democrats in Germany and the Conservatives in France and so on and so forth. So there is an utter lack of urgency um, and, and, and principle there. But I agree with you also, by the way, 
Uh, so that's one addressee. Another addressee actually is part of the further left um, who uh, sort of think that our political system right now is so illegitimate that anybody who talks about defending any part of it, not wholesale, but any part of it, against the populists is, 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 is therefore by, by, by their nature, sort of neoliberal shill, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, and, and that to me is quite worrying because what we see in history is that sort of left populists and so on actually quite rarely win, but they are often instrumental in ensuring that we don't have enough of a coalition to defend our institutions against the far right when it rises. And that is a, a, a phenomenon I see quite strongly around the world, including in Italy, where we should remember that the Five Star Movement, though it's not in any straightforward wing left wing now, was very much founded uh, as a left wing movement. The last thing I'll say briefly is, is, is a point about the media, which I actually am most struck by in, in Britain. I mean, when I came to this country for university, I was um, enamored of the media and the, the, the very robust style of interviewing they have, which is much more interesting and entertaining than anything you would see on TV in Germany or the United States. But I do sometimes find it a little uh, cynical and sneering. Um, everybody is always trying to recreate in every single interview the famous uh, Jeremy Paxman interview with Michael Howard, even when that's just not what the occasion is. Uh, a few months ago, I went on, uh, on BBC Radio to, uh, to talk about a report we'd published. And before me was on, and I have no particular sympathy for the current government, um, but before me went on the Minister for International Development talking about um, sort of programs to try and eradicate landmines. And the interview, and you know, he's, I, I think they seem to have done some decent progress on that. And he was clearly a well-intentioned guy. He was working on an important topic. And the tone of the interview was just like, well, I don't understand. I mean, Lady Diana raised this issue 25 years ago. And why are there still any landmines in the world at all? You know, like, it's, it's just this sort of, you know, I know you're lying to me and you're no good anyway before we've even gotten into the substance of a conversation. And I, I do find that quite a rose of democracy, actually. I want to explore, um, before we, we open it up, two uh, ways in which I think, uh, one existing way in which the RSA would say we ought to address this, and one that I'm going to be floating uh, in my annual lecture in a, in a few weeks' time, and then, and then we'll open up. So the first is, and I, and I don't think either of these things are very strongly expressed in your argument. The first is devolution. So, you know, Across the world, mayors are more popular than presidents and prime ministers. Uh, municipal politics tends to be more bilateral, less uh, sectarian, less polarized. The form of power there is closer to people. It's more responsive. You know, when there's a blizzard, the mayor gets a broom out, you know. Um, Daniel Bell said a long time ago, the sociologist Daniel Bell said that in the modern world, the nation state is too big for the small things in life and too small for the big things in life. <laughs> So I'm kind of wondering whether, to what extent is this crisis that you're describing a crisis of the nation state, actually, and that one of the things that we need to do in order to respond to it is a radical localization of power, because when power is at the local level, some of the pathologies you describe don't seem to be so present. Yeah, I think that's certainly a part of the solution. Um, I'm actually just, just, just reviewing a book that's all about the nationalization of American politics, um, and making precisely the argument that that book really understates that it's the nationalization of American politics that has allowed for the rise of a deep partisanship. When you go back to the 1960s, uh, you know, and you have Tammany Hall and the sort of corrupt machines in politics in Boston and so on, uh, there are lots of bad at attributes, but it also means that you can't split all Americans into two camps because actually the Democratic mayor of Chicago and the Democratic mayor of Boston, A, don't think about ideology much, they think about how to get public works for the people who vote for them for those reasons, and maybe they actually have competing interests because they just both want to get as much money as possible to their town. Now the Democrats and Republicans are ideological parties um, and the country is increasingly split along this one sort of bright dividing line. Um, and, and, and that is one of the things that explains why some like Donald Trump, once he was the candidate of a Republican party, was able to get elected. Um, Julian Zari, a, a good American political scientist, has the expression that the problem in America is weak parties and strong partisanship that the institutions no longer have the ability to exclude people they dislike, but once they become the standard bearer, the partisanship has become so strong that I reverts for it. And partisanship is, 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 is less strong at the, at the local level. So I agree that making stronger mayors, devolving the authorities we can, is a good part of the solution. But I think the problem is actually that there are larger factors 
driving towards nationalization of politics, including uh, the rise of a, of a national media that people primarily get their information from, um, including the way in which politics is now less about getting a job because your candidate got elected and it's sort of semi-corrupt system. It's more about seeing our values and to some degree our sort of tribe realized that you're part of a, of a, of a, of a left-wing tribe or a right-wing tribe which comes with where you live and what your tastes are and who your friends are. And a lot of politics has become about seeing that group validated over the people in your country who you really don't like particularly. Um, and I think we can slightly counter steer with uh, localization of politics, but it's going to have a limited impact. And then finally, before I open up, the, the other thing I wonder is whether or not also part of what your, uh, part of what you're exposing in your book is the crisis of representative democracy uh, as a system. Uh, so um, I often wonder how popular would supermarkets be <laughs> if every five years we voted for our favorite supermarket and then the one that was supported by say 34% of the population then became the only supermarket <laughs> we were allowed to shop in and was allowed to choose the goods that we bought every week. I think we probably hate supermarkets but that is how representative democracy, it's an incredibly blunt mandate. Mm. And also the other problem with representative democracy is the second somebody becomes elected, they cease to be a human being, by definition, I'm afraid. That's our view. <laughs> you know, the second you're a politician, you are of a different class of people. You're not like me anymore. But yet democracy is supposed to be about electing people like me to make decisions. So the thing I'll be arguing for in a month's time is for much greater integration of deliberative democratic forms, things like citizens' juries, citizens' assemblies, where citizens are gathered in robust processes to kind of make decisions, all based mm -hmm. upon the brilliant central principle of the jury, which is one of the few institutions we haven't lost faith in, actually, which is if I'd listened to that same evidence, I would have reached that same conclusion. You don't talk about that at all in the book. And I, I, to what extent do you think that some of what's going on is a reflection of the fact that representative democracy in a world of personalization and choice and fast change is just not fit for purpose? And we have to think about how we, have, we do dem democracy differently. I, I think I mentioned uh, participatory budgeting, new participatory budgeting, and, and, and things like that. I think it, it, it's proven to work pretty well at the local level and involving people in, you know, what kind of projects the town should build when there's a little bit of spare money. Do you build the library or do you build the swimming pool and so on? I think this is actually very meaningful to people and it's in a domain over which they obviously have expertise. Um, but not just the I local would, level. I mean, the, the referendum in Ireland now was, was crafted by citizens, the abortion referendum was crafted by a citizens' assembly decided what the question should be in the process around it. So these things can be used for national things as well. Sure, um, and certainly, you know, having citizens draft a question about Brexit may have improved the nature of a referendum, but as it turns out, the set of choices that you actually have to make when you undertake a project like leaving the European Union is so complex that the best citizen jury in the world would not have been able to formulate the question in a way where people would have been able to give subtle feedback on it, unless you would have completely overtaxed the patience of voters in the waiting booth who would have had to read you know, 500 pages of documents and sort of answered 74 questions, and then you would have ended up with a completely <coughs> incoherent menu of choices, right? So I think in the end, unfortunately, you do need political office holders to structure a lot of that agenda and to make some of those decisions. And more broadly, I think, you know, what I call undemocratic liberalism actually presents us with a real technocratic dilemma, which is to say that the, the answer of the populists is to say, well, get rid of all of these institutions. They're all basically sort of elite conspiracy against the people and they don't have any um, uh, real purpose. And I think that's wrong. I think a lot of these institutions actually arose for very good reasons because they were dealing with things from how to keep power plants safe to, uh, you know, how to regulate the money supply in a sensible way that ordinary citizens don't have a lot of expertise over. And when you think of some of the big challenges that now face us, like climate change, it's quite obvious that you'll need huge international cooperation, part of a point of which has to be to lock in the actions of each individual state. And so if 200 countries around the world somehow have to come to a conclusion, obviously you or I are not going to feel like we've actually had a real impact on that. Um, now, I think the, the standard establishment answer to that, which is, well, so all of these things are needed and they're doing a good job, so let's not worry about them, is wrong as well, right? I think that's not taking seriously the degree to which it alienates people and to which it actually betrays uh, 
one of the core promises of our political system. Um, and so I think you know, things like citizens' juries and so on are a great way of trying to attenuate that dilemma a little bit, but the basic dilemma, I think, uh, remains. Um, very briefly on the point about representative institutions, I do think the internet is a real threat to them, or, and not just because it allows us to spread fake news and traps us in filter bubbles online, all those kinds of things, but because it undermines a core component of a democratic myth, which is that our institutions, especially in, in Britain and in the United States, were never founded to be democracies. They were, uh, in the United Kingdom, a strange historical compromise that evolved over time. In the United States, actually explicitly designed not to be a democracy. Um, the true uh, definition of a republic in contradistinction to a democracy, the Founding Fathers wrote in the Federalist Papers, is that uh, in the American system, there is uh, the, the people in their collective capacity are completely excluded from any share in the government. That's the definition of the American Republic given by the Founding Fathers. But over the course of the 19th century, we sort of said, well, no, actually, the set of institutions is the most democratic we can be, because we can't all assemble in one place, we can't all vote to, together in any kind of direct way, so this is actually a legitimate expression of democracy. And I think digital technology is really calling that in doubt, because people now have an instinctive sense of what it is like to, uh, to vote on Pop Idol or, or, or Big Brother, what it is like you know, on Facebook, you know, four people have liked something, and you click the thumbs up button, and you know, it lights up blue to reward your brain, and then it becomes a five. And so we have a sense of what that kind of direct efficacy looks like. Now, representative institutions aren't designed for that kind of direct efficacy. And I do think that poses a fundamental challenge. Um, and rethinking how we can have a slightly different institutional setup that still serves the two fundamental ideals of democracy, individual freedom and collective self-rule, uh, is a very urgent task. Great. I'm sorry we've monopolized so much time up here. Let's take a couple of rounds of questions. So who would like to ask a question? If you could raise your hand, that would be great. We'll start here. I, don't, I haven't read the book as yet, but I look forward to doing so, so enjoy your royalty. Um, you said something, I understand why you said it, you said that um, when you go to various nations, each nation has an, a, a specific reason why what's happened to them has happened to them. So if you're in America, it's because of this, you're in Britain, it's because of this. But the title of the book is The People Versus Democracy, and I'm not convinced it is The People Versus, versus Democracy, because in each, in each area, there's always someone who's trying to hijack um, general feelings of uh, unhappiness or degradation. So in, in, the, in the States, uh, and certainly here with Brexit, the people who kind of bankroll those kind of campaigns, typically over here and in the States, is the libertarian right. That's where they're the people who are kind of really underwriting those, those campaigns. And I'm sure in various other European states there'll be other, other parties. Is it really the people versus democracy, or is it particular groups versus democracy? Mm -hmm. Interesting also that you, the libertarian right is a kind of popular worldview in the technology aristocracy as well, of course. Uh, let's just take one other on, on the back row and then, and then here, and we'll, I'll, I'll, Russia can answer those three, yeah. Um, my question is to, um, do you think that the, hang on, the illiberal democracy is a, no, sorry, <laughs> is a transitional state or is it a stable state that, um, you know, could persist? Great, and then there was a third, yeah, here. Yeah. Um, is there a uh, correlation, if you're talking about um, people wanting control and feeling like they've lost control because there's governmental bodies or quangos or whatever, so is there a correlation between populism uh, and the amount of privatization? Because if, you could, if, if, if people felt more in control and, and had more ownership over uh, electricity, for example, would that, is, is there a correlation there? Mm -hmm. So is it the fault of the libertarian uh, right? Is a liberal democracy a stable possibility? <laughs> um, and if we held more assets in common, would we feel a stronger sense of agency? Great, yeah. Um, so, so on the first question about sort of whether it's the people or whether it's these sort of particular special interest groups, including the libertarian right and perhaps some other groups in other countries, um, well, you know, I think the, the question is why it is. So, so, so one way that this question is always reflected in the United States is not about the libertarian right, it's about Russia, right? And is this about, you know, is this actually Americans who voted for Donald Trump or is it sort of because of Russia? And, and I think that debate gets a little caricatural. 
where sort of on the one hand it's, oh, well, you know, there's no problem with the system as it stands, and there's no problem with the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. It's all just because of Russia, right? And on the other end, people say, well, anybody who thinks that, you know, Russia had a nefarious influence on the election and clearly tried to manipulate it and so on, uh, just is completely unwilling to admit that there's any problem in the pre... And I, I don't think that's the option set, right? I mean, clearly... Uh, Russia had an influence on, on the American election. Clearly the fact that Republican elites ended up actually supporting Donald Trump. The people like the Koch brothers did end up funding his campaign, the campaign of other Republican candidates, was one of the reasons why Donald Trump was elected. And similarly, I think here we've seen the way, actually much under-discussed in Britain, in which Russia had an impact on the Brexit campaign, and parts of the libertarian right obviously were funding it and so on. All of that had an impact, but you also have to ask the question, well, why is it that they could succeed? Why is it that so many people were open to voting for Donald Trump or so many people were open to voting for Brexit in the first place? And to answer that question, you have to look at the most structural common drivers that I talk about in the book when I was talking about in my talk. Um, the question about illiberal democracy is, is a very important one. Um, so some of the people who claim that we shouldn't be using that term precisely say, well, it's not a stable system. Um, and I agree it's not stable. I think the form that populism often initially takes is illiberal democracy, and the effect it has over time often is straightforward dictatorship. Now, I think there's a, one element of a liberal democracy that can be stable, which is the discrimination against minorities. I think you can do that over time. I mean, the United States has been a liberal democracy for, for many centuries until at least the, the 1960s, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean that you also have a collapse of all the other sort of governing rules and norms and so on. It's just a sort of crying injustice but in an odd way, it doesn't mean that it infects everything else in terms of um, whether you respect free elections and so on and so forth. When you're talking about the element of a liberal democracy that goes against the rule of law and the separation of powers, that's much harder to do. Once you start controlling the press, it's harder ensuring that the vote count is also fair. And once the vote count isn't fair, there's not much left, right? And so I think that as we're seeing in Hungary, a liberal democracy usually gives way pretty quickly to forms of pretty straightforward dictatorship. Um, and then on the question of, of, of privatization, uh, which is an important one, I mean, I don't know that um, that's obviously true in comparative perspectives. So first of all, there's obviously forms of left-wing populism that take a form of state ownership and that can be very dangerous as we see in places like Venezuela, right? Um, but even leaving that aside, just thinking about whether sort of forms of privatization then give rise to right-wing populism, um, you know, there's an argument to be made there that the Scandinavian countries and, uh, have had less right-wing populism than, uh, than, than other countries in Europe and that Canada perhaps has had less of it than the United States. Um, but I wonder whether it's a little early to make the judgment because we now see how quickly populism is rising in, in Northern Europe. The Sweden Democrats may become the second biggest party in the country in the next elections. They have actually strong roots in the neo-Nazi movement quite recently. They've become more moderate, but, but it's one of the most extremist parties in origin. And you know, everywhere I go, I get the question, what about Canada? You know, hasn't Canada somehow managed to escape populism? And doesn't that teach us something? The one place where I didn't get that question was in Toronto. <laughs> because we have uh, provincial elections coming up in Ontario in which uh, Doug Ford, the brother of Rob Ford, the former mayor of Toronto and avid smoker of crack, um, is likely to become the next premier on a very populist platform. Um, so I think it's plausible that there may be something to that, but I would say give it five or ten years and we'll have better evidence then, and I fear that it'll turn out to be not quite true. So I could, yeah, I'll take one more question because we've, we, we, we've nearly run out of time, but I've seen one last hand. Go on. Thank you. Um, do you think that, um, uh, do you think that part of the causation of this is that our world seems to be becoming increasingly complex uh, in every field? And it feels like those fields are so rich and complex that only computers can understand them human brains can't quite, at the same time as a lack of faith in the elites, partly because of the economic factors and the uh, growing disparity lack, uh, between richer and poorer people, uh, between nations and within nations, 
uh, and also things like lack of meritocracy within our societies. Yeah, I think the um, complexity is, is, is one of the things that really drives the rise of, of undemocratic liberalism or rise of our democracy, right? Uh, our societies are so complex that we have to have incredibly detailed regulation about all kinds of things. And I think the slight pipe dream of the Brexiteers is that we get rid of the European Union, the European Commission, and then we can get rid of all of those things. But I think it'll just lead to a recreation of similar institutions on a national scale. Now, perhaps it's better. Perhaps it's better to have them, you know, a few miles from here than, than over in Brussels. I think that's a legitimate point of view. But, but to think that the only reason for that regulation is the existence of the European Union, and if we become sovereign, we no longer have to deal with any of those things, is illusory, because it's a reaction to an actual set of complexities that is out there in the world. And so that's why I think it's a real dilemma that either we um, give a lot of those decisions over to, to bureaucrats and technocrats and so on and feel like we're not really ruling ourselves, or we end up with worse and worse outcomes because we're not dealing with those things and we have industrial accidents and we don't have economic growth. Um, and then I think a lot of people start to feel, well, uh, the system isn't delivering for me, so let's try something new. I want to say one thing very briefly at, at, at the end, because in I your know... Last in my last minute. In my last minute, less than a minute. Um, I know that sometimes pe people come away from, from my talks and say that uh, they're terribly depressing. So. <laughs> uh, now, I suppose people in Britain like being depressed, so perhaps that's okay. But, um, but, but I actually am not downcast by, by all of this. Um, and that's because I think, you know, when I grew up, politically, it didn't seem like anything we did was that consequential and important. I mean, things mattered, but they didn't seem to matter in the way that they do now. And I don't think that anything is, is foreordained. We don't know how this movie ends yet, and it may be that we're fighting windmills, it may be that there's nothing to be done, uh, but we don't know that yet. And unlike the citizens of some of those countries where for time populists have already won or where dictators rule, we still have a freedom to fight for our values and fight for our ideals. Um, so I think we should make good use of that freedom and, and, and fight for our values and the optimistic expectation that we might actually have a real impact on the world. So uh, Yasha's book is available outside and he's uh, happy to sign copies of it. You can read it, it's uh, brilliant, and then you can put it to one side and then in 10 years <laughs> you can take it out and either it, it, it will prove that you were wrong about all of this and everything will be fine and it will turn out that what you thought was a trend was actually a cycle or things will be better because all of us have read your book and we've acted on your recommendations so win -win. the world has changed or you'll have to hide <laughs> the book because the state police will arrest you if they find that you, uh, that you have a copy. So one way or another uh, you'll be able to pick it off your bookshelves and, 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 and reflect in a few years time. But I very much encourage you to buy it. It's an absolutely brilliant book and it's an incredibly important book as well. It just remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking Yeshemug. Okay.